Welcome to the Body Kindness Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Scritchfield, and I'm here to help you find your inner caregiver. You'll have more compassion, less shame, and the tools you need to deal with a culture that just does not want you to be free to give yourself fierce love. You are welcome and you belong in our community where we value your well-being, we share our experiences and support each other on the body kindness journey, and we know that your health and your worth is not dependent on your weight. If you would like to enjoy self-care, be less self-critical, and make your life about more than your health routines, join us at bodykindnessbook.com slash start. The last two chapters of the book are actually the whole reason why the book exists. They're the whole reason why all of it exists is so that we can dismantle the systems in the world that are in the way of all of us being able to radically, unapologetically live in our bodies and our beings just as we are and with all the capacity and all of the opportunity to thrive and succeed and flourish and become that highest, most magnificent version of ourselves Mm -hmm. without obstruction. That's what I want for everybody in the world. And the only way to get that is for all of us to divest from a system that says that only some of us should be allowed to have that. That was Sonia Renee Taylor. She's the author of six books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Body is Not an Apology, second edition, The Power of a Radical Self-Love. I'm so honored to have had the opportunity to talk with Sonia Renee Taylor again for the second time in the Body Kindness podcast. I truly believe you're going to get something powerful and meaningful out of this conversation. Please support her books and her work. All of her links are in the show notes for this episode. Be sure to check them out, including she has a Venmo and Patreon. It's at Sonia Renee Taylor. If this is your first opportunity to learn from her, allow me to tell you a little bit more. So she is the founder and radical executive officer of The Body is Not an Apology. It's a digital media and education company promoting radical self-love and body empowerment as a foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. Her work is highly sought after. She's an award-winning performance poet, activist, and transformational leader with a global reach. She has enlightened and inspired organizations, audiences, and individuals from boardrooms to prisons, universities to homeless shelters, elementary schools to some of the biggest stages in the world. And um, you may have heard she was on the Brene Brown podcast, so pretty cool. Um, I just know you're going to get something meaningful and powerful out of our conversation. And I thank you so much for tuning in and listening and supporting um, the Body Kindness podcast. So I am so excited to talk to you, Sonia Renee Taylor, goddess divine. (laughs) Thank you. Oh my gosh. You are literally, I mean, there were critical steps in my life where your wisdom came to open me up and, Mm -hmm. um, the body is not an apology. I remember hearing about your work and your poetry and I I wanted to know more. And when the body is not an apology came out, I said, there's just from the cover alone, there's something Mm -hmm. in here, that feeling of the Mm -hmm. nine-year-old version of me, right? Apologizing already. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And thinking of the space I've held with clients. And I knew I was like, this is, this is going to transform me. And Mm -hmm. that it did. And I have recommended your book to clients to people I've had the privilege to get to mentor. And back in the first wave, (laughs) it was very transformational. But one of the reasons why we're talking today, one of the many is (laughs) that we have a new edition. Wait a minute, I'm gonna reach under here so that I could do it at the same time with you. We do. (laughs) Yes. 
I am so excited for this book and for the foreword. Yeah. It's Yomo yes. Ruo, right? I love yes. every, everything um, Idioma is about. And then, I mean, Brene Brown. Yeah, I got the little Brene Brown quote. <laughs> So just so you know, all the shares, oh my gosh, you know, it, all the buzz, not just in the health at every size community, but in the dietetics community, my friends, have you heard this podcast? Have you heard this podcast? And then it was in, in my daughter's um, group. So I am in a white parents affinity group. And then our facilitator shared the link and I was like, and then finally, I think it was in that group where I finally said, she is so famous. And that was such an amazing interview. Um, and, and I said, I got to talk to her first. <laughs> As if, I don't know what it was, but I got to talk to her first. Um, but anyway, clearly you, you are like this up, up and away. <laughs> and it is so well deserved. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into the nitty gritty of the book, but just so we let people know early, it's your book yeah. birthday, like today it's in the, the US. Yes, it is the second edition book birthday. Um, which a is rebirth. actually so a rebirth. <laughs> yes. It, it, so it's a rebirth and it's actually many birthdays. So it is also, we are, um, we are on the official 10 year anniversary of the body is not an apology from the first days that the words were ever uttered out of the, that we put it on Facebook, but the first day post on Facebook was 10 years ago this day. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That seems like such a long time and such a short time at the same time. time. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly my experience of it. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Thank you. And just, I mean, I guess, I guess that could be an interesting like reflection, right? When the words first came out of your mouth. Yeah. What was that moment like? Yeah. So the, there's a little bit of a, so the, to the birthday that is today is mm -hmm. the day that the words went public. I yeah. So the Facebook website, you said, it. here it is. Here's the my Facebook page. Here's okay. a Facebook. Let's right. start a Facebook page. Right. 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 I'm gonna, here's my picture of me in this little corset, <laughs> unapologetic, unapologetically in my body. Now other people share your picture. That was what happened on this day. Um, but the first time that I uttered the body is not an apology, which I talk about in the preface of the book, mm -hmm. was in a conversation with a friend about maybe about eight months earlier mm -hmm. um, in a conversation with a friend at a poetry slam uh, where she was um, afraid that she had an unintended pregnancy mm -hmm. and, uh, and did not and was not using condoms with this partner who I happened to know was a casual partner. Um, sorry about that, no um, that I knew as a casual partner. And when I asked her why, you know, when I asked her why she wasn't using condoms, she shared that her disability, she had cerebral palsy, made it difficult for her to be sexual. And she didn't feel entitled to ask the person to use a condom. Right. And I said to her, your body is not an apology. It's not something you offer to say sorry for my disability. And so that was the first time that the words were ever uttered. Um, and then, you know, and then it took eight for them to keep working with me. I mean, eight minutes, eight months mm -hmm. for them to keep working with me, for them to keep, you know, pushing me towards what it was um, that they wanted to be, which was out in the world for other people. Mm -hmm. So when you said that to your friend at the Poetry Slam, did the words, I mean, did you get a feeling of the words or did your friend get it? Like, was it like a, whoa, something powerful just came out yes. in the universe? <laughs> Yes. Yes. It was absolutely like, oh, we made a thing. Right. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, I said something and, you know, like she cried and, you know, and I held her, but I also was like, yeah, there, something just came through me that wants to be, that is, wants to be something. And I don't know what yet, but it wants to be something. And the first thing it wanted to be was a poem. Cause I was like, well, that's very poetic. So mm -hmm. maybe we should poetry part of it first um 
And so it first wanted to be a poem, but I think what it always wanted was to direct and in the first place. So its first point of direction and guidance was for my friend. And through the poem, it became direction and guidance for me. Um, and then it was like, all right, that's fine. I'm glad that that is direction and guidance for you. It is direction and guidance in the world. So how, how will you, Sonia, make sure that this direction and guidance gets out into the world? And you say it take, took you eight months as if the, that's a long time. And I'm sitting here going, eight, <laughs> eight months, that's like fast to figure it all out. Or at least get, <laughs> like you said, get it going. So that's, yeah. It, but yeah, yeah, it's that feeling like, uh-oh, something fundamentally shifted and it's going to keep yeah. shifting. And I'm sure that that day, maybe you didn't even imagine a book yet, let alone all the millions, <laughs> literally, of people you've impacted. Yeah, I, you know, I'm one of those people who, when I'm given a vision, mm -hmm. I will see the vision and then I will be directed towards moving towards that vision. And then I have to forget it. Like I have to forget I ever said it. And then I just have to kind of be in the to keep going. So when I first started, um, I had an, a poetry event in Seattle, um, maybe the same week that I had put mm -hmm. up the Facebook page. And I said on that stage, I am starting a movement. Join me. <laughs> I'm starting a movement of radical self-love. Follow me. Um, and I forgot about that show. I forgot I ever said that. <laughs> and like, Four years later, someone shared a clip with me and they were like, oh, you always knew. And I was like, oh, I guess I did because I totally forgot. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of those things where it's like the vision will come through. And then in order to actually do the work to bring the vision into the world, I have to kind of move away from the vision space and move into the just what does this look like on a daily basis? What does it look like to just live this? Um, and through the practice of living it, it moves me into sort of yeah, the manifestation of the vision. Yeah. And it has been an amazing, amazing journey um, yeah. with this book, which we'll get into. I can't wait. I cannot wait. And also you were going to have something that I've been dying, waiting for forever, which is a workbook. Yes. And like, uh, like I need this today. Like I need yeah. Sonia's brain <laughs> and guidance, like help me now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for my clients too, right? Stuff we can do together, you yes. know, for friends. Yeah. Like this is, I mean, we all, we all needed to be learning. My body is not an apology, you know, early on, as soon as we're forming sentences. Yeah, you know, yeah. I have a six and an eight year old and early on, I taught them my body, my choice. And mm -hmm. interestingly, we found out that they would fight against baths and we're like, can we get two baths a week? And <laughs> your choice? Can we get some I love, I love when parents tell me the way in which their like body liberation messages backfire on them with their kids. <laughs> so it's like, I didn't mean for it this way <laughs> yeah exactly exactly but um yeah i mean your body is yeah. not apology what a powerful thing that we all need to hear in some way shape or form um yeah. and i would love to when the workbook is out because it's it's i don't think it's out till mid-march right mid or late march next, yeah next month okay. next month march 16th right now is the release date so. okay well, as soon as and I get one in my hands, I'm going to ask you to come back on the weekend because I'm going to be flipping through, doing some pages, and then we'll yeah. have a little session for people. Oh, I would love that. I would love that. That would be wonderful. I really wanted them to come out at the same time, but I literally was writing them at the same time. <laughs> and it was also, I mean, I can't even begin to talk about what life was handing me as I was trying to create these books, but it was at the beginning of COVID. Um, oh. And so... The, yeah. yeah, it was, it was, I was like, we're, as much as I wish these could happen at the exact same time, go on ahead, get the mm -hmm. second edition in you. And then, you know, and what I actually, what I like is that it's a bit of a dance, right? The second edition, and we'll talk about it, it's really, it's focused on great. We've talked about what radical self-love is. We've talked about how these systems of indoctrination have removed us from it. We've taught in the first 
book, we talk a lot about, all right, what is my interpersonal work to reconnect with my own radical self-love journey? Mm -hmm. The second edition is like, great, we've done that foundation. Now, what is your interpersonal work to connect to radical self-love in the ways in which we relate to other bodies and the systems of oppression that impact other bodies? Mm -hmm. How do I become a radical self-love advocate for all bodies? That really is the focus of the second edition. And then the workbook says, beautiful. I am working it externally. I am building the muscle to interrupt these systems out in the world. And now how do I keep practicing inside of me? How do I keep practicing in my mm. own journey? Because mm. it is always both of what we are doing in ourselves for ourselves as radical self-love and always how are we using this as a tool to dismantle oppression in the world? And mm. it always is a dance that requires in both. And so I like the, I like the back and forth of the good. Yeah. And you know, here's the thing. This is so necessary, right? Because the belief, right, in the self-help world, and whether that's a belief in publishing or the belief in culture, the belief culturally, the belief in white supremacy is like, oh, these are separate things. These people work on themselves. And we're just <laughs> pretend like we can't see what's happening in, in culture. And it exactly. is, you know, a fight, right, to get people to see actually we create the culture and the culture creates us and we can't be separating things. And you also, you, how do you do radical self-love without an understanding or awareness in which the culture has created privileges for you or created barriers for you? That's pretty integral exactly. to your healing journey. Absolutely. If you're, if you're not, if you're not tackling that part, you're not doing radical self-love. You're doing, mm -hmm. you know, you're doing self-esteem. You're doing something that is individualistic, something that I propose ultimately is not sustainable. You might feel better for a while, but at the end of the day, because you are operating inside of systems that both gift you things and deny you things, you will once again find yourself up against the constraints of a body oppression system. You will always find yourself up against that again. And so unless we are always recognizing the ways in which our, our ideas about ourselves have been externalized, while either validated or externally deplored. And until we actually can see the difference between who it is I am in my most authentic self and what the world demands of me, until I can put some space between that, I'm always going to get sucked back into performing for the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? And what a mental distraction, right? The mass and out there performing to the world. And it's like, who's getting left alone and isolated and lost, right? Your, exactly. your true self, your true sense of self. Yeah. yeah. And then we wonder why we feel disconnected and hopeless and mm -hmm. still struggling, right? And it's because mm -hmm. we haven't actually gotten back to our source, mm -hmm. you know, to our source, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I've been holding up the book, not only because I want everyone <laughs> to look at the cover and hopefully as we've been talking, they want to buy, want to buy, want to buy, 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 but <laughs> because the first thing I said and the first thing my girls said when they saw this was this is beautiful. And then the second question was, Mama, who's this? <laughs> and I said, this is a friend. Mommy's going to get to talk to her. Um, but their first reaction was, this is beautiful. And so I wanted to ask about the cover and the butterfly and if there was a meaning behind it or a purpose behind it or anything like that. I mean, I definitely think it's up for anyone's interpretation. When, you know, when the uh, artists uh, at Barrett Kohler approached me about like, well, so what do we want to do with the second, with this new cover? Um, they, they sent me, a, you know, a multitude of options. Mm -hmm. What I knew that I wanted to feel, what I wanted to feel when I looked at it was I wanted to feel the, the mystery of unfolding. Right. Like mm. that there is so like part of what keeps us from taking a radical self-love journey for ourselves and as it relates to our relationship with other bodies in the world is this fear that we're going to get it wrong, this fear that we won't be good enough, all of this, all of this unknown. Um, and oftentimes we see the unknown as this really 
foreboding and terrifying experience. And what I really wanted to sort of evoke was the idea that the, the unknown is beautiful. Mm-hmm. What if the unknown is glorious and divine and soft and, and, and gorgeous? What if the unknown is gorgeous? And so I wanted there to be this sense of sort of mystery and unfolding, but I wanted it to be a mystery and an unfolding that is um, welcoming, that mm-hmm. says, yes, yes, this is a, an uncertain journey, but it is a journey that is absolutely worth taking. Uh, and that was kind of the feeling. And, you know, I often think about, you know, the process of becoming a butterfly, which is just the world's most intense process. (laughs) And I did, so, you know, I knew that, you know, the caterpillar goes into chrysalis and Mm -hmm. um, I did not, and I, and I actually knew that it turns to goo, right? Like that the caterpillar completely decomposes, completely decomposes. What I did not know is that the process of decomposition inside of the chrysalis activates cells in the caterpillar that are called imaginal cells. Mm. And when I learned that, I was like, brain blown. Like that our our innate selves have already imagined the highest form of us. Mm. And yes, in the dark night of the soul, we feel like we are completely de, you know, like de- everything decomposing (laughs) like whatever it is right that we are absolutely being rendered to you know the smallest versions of ourselves but what's actually happening is that that which has always been in us that was already imagined Mm -hmm. is being activated so that we might emerge as the fullest versions of ourselves Mm -hmm. the most beautiful magnificent versions of ourselves Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I'm like, right, no, I, the, the work of radical self-love is to turn to goo in some ways. Okay. And- I was going to make that connection because I was thinking of the uncertainty, right? And nobody likes that. That's the mm-hmm. highest discomfort. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And you're talking about it being beautiful and amazing. What if it was all these good things? And I was like, I think Sonia wants us to believe that the goo is good. Like, you know, that the uncertainty. The goo that's- is good. That's exactly what it is. The goo is the imaginal sales. Mm-hmm. In order to activate them, you have to decompose. In order mm-hmm. to activate what radical self-love can be in the world, we have to decompose what exists now. Mm-hmm. And that is scary and it's terrifying. And inside of us, because we come here as radical self-love, is all ready, all that needs to be for us to emerge into the highest, most beautiful form that serves us and serves the world. That's what imaginal cells are, Mm -hmm. is all that already known source information for our highest selves. And so let yourself decompose, let yourself Mm -hmm. turn to goo, (laughs) let yourself be rendered to complete mush for the purpose of returning to our source knowledge of self because our source knowledge of self will always lead us to the most magnificent, most beautiful, highest versions of ourselves. Yeah, and it is so essential because what actually happens is we spend our lives letting ourselves be conditioned yes. by whoever has the power in our culture. Exactly. Because right? even if exactly. it's in our own family, our own family who should be guiding us, right? And maybe so they are in a lot of ways. They yeah. are also a product of the culture. Yeah. So we're constantly sensing out and absorbing it, saying, this must be me. This must be truth. This must be fact. Yes. This must be what I follow. And what I'm loving about this is like, okay, so that's sort of what it's always been. We are now in the chrysalis allowing the decomposing to take place, yes. right? Getting to the goo, the good goo, the and goo. Then out emerges the butterfly. And between yes. the second edition of The Body is Not an Apology and then the workbook, which is going to be Your Body is Not an Apology. Yes. That will help us get into the good goo. Exactly, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I love from the back, right? In the big, bold letters, a global movement guided by love. And I mean, 
that it's so powerful. First of all, it is for everyone, right? You know? Everyone, everybody and everybody. <laughs> yeah. And that it is a movement and that, and guided by love, you know, love. We are, we're, we're emotion. We are, we're feeling creatures who think we all have many, many emotions and even our bad emotions are good because they're trying to tell us something's not right. <laughs> but love as the supreme emotion, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, and it also seems to be a lot of what we lack when things are off course, like love for ourselves, our mistakes, our flaws, you know, um, our, our self judgment, the fact that we didn't find your book even sooner, whatever it is, it seems to be that we're in, we're in deep in inner critic mode. We are lacking the practice of love. And yes. then of course there's the external loving connections where you talked about for yourself, but also the world. It's this idea of that we have a collective well-being and collectively we need to get back to love and away from this individualism, me and me alone and whatever. Like that, I think is what's gotten us into a lot of trouble in the first place. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, one of, one of the things that I love about love <laughs> is that it is, you know, it is both one of the most powerful resources in the world, right? Like, mm -hmm. and an inexhaustible resource. And also the thing that we most frequently forget to reach for when things feel fraught, mm -hmm. right? It's so it's the, it is both the thing that we are the fastest to give away, but it's also the most easily replenishable when we remind ourselves that we have access to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just feel very clear that we <clears throat> live in an example of what the world looks like when it's not governed by love. Mm. We, uh, when I look outside, I'm very clear that yeah. I'm inside of a world that isn't governed by love. Mm -hmm. And, and so at this point, even if you don't buy it, right? Like mm -hmm. I, this is my thing. Like, I don't, I'm not, I'm not selling radical self-love. Mm -hmm. I'm calling it an experiment, right? Like, even if you're not sure it works, mm -hmm. you definitely have something to compare it to. So mm -hmm. run the experiment. We've tried running it off of greed. We've tried running it off of money. We've tried running it off of power. We've tried running it off of, uh, you know, patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacist delusion. We've tried running it off of all of those things. Mm -hmm. And we see where it's landed us in a global pandemic with worldwide uprisings and massive death tolls and horrifying disconnection and emotional depletion. We have tried that. Mm -hmm. why not try running it off of love and just see what happens mm -hmm. and it is so i mean love is really threaded through every chapter of yeah. the book um you know in one it's about making self-love radical um in three you know i think we were starting to get there building a radical self-love practice in the age of loathing and mm -hmm. I love that the, the way that you build out these chapters, it's kind of where we're the most comfortable. Got to work on me, got to work on me, right? Because we love self-improvement. We eat it up <laughs> like chocolate cake, you know? <laughs> it's the best cake I've ever had. More, more, more work. I'm not yeah. good enough, I need more. But you make a pivot in four and five, right? I mean, it's, again, it's threaded throughout, but it's a, it's a sharp right turn, shall we say. Yeah. <laughs> a new way ordered by love yeah right yeah. love is the supreme guiding right so, element so absolutely yeah and then and then i think where we were getting to how to fight with love yeah yeah so for me and i'd like to be really clear about this i none of the work that i've ever done was ever to tend to anyone's individual self-esteem and self-confidence <laughs> i as much as i love humans it's a lot i would not be putting in that kind of labor to just help you feel better about yourself mm -hmm. the entire point of this work for me as a fat black queer neurodivergent cisgendered woman is that i live in a world that harms bodies like mine that kills bodies like mine um and that has not only told me that I shouldn't love my body, but it's told the whole world that it shouldn't love my body. And what I'm very clear about is that the reason people believe that, the reason that people 
uh, jump on that bandwagon of loathing my body is because it is a, the society has said you can leverage your self worth by deciding that this person is less than you. Mm -hmm. And as soon as people's self worth is not tied to someone else being lesser than them, mm -hmm. then the threats to my body become far less likely in the world. Mm -hmm. If you don't need to hate me to love you, then, I, then the world doesn't need to hate me. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you just love you, <laughs> and you and you are clear that you are innately and divinely made, then you can get, and you are innately and divinely made without any comparison to anyone else. You just mm -hmm. are. Mm -hmm. Then everyone else also gets to just be. And inside of that world, the systems that we have built based on that comparison, based on that need for someone to be greater or less than you, for you to understand yourself. Once that doesn't need to exist anymore, then the systems that are tied to it also become obsolete. Mm -hmm. They become useless. We don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. And so the last two chapters of the book are actually the whole reason why the book exists. They're the whole reason why all of it exists is so that we can dismantle the systems in the world that are in the way of all of us being able to radically, unapologetically live in our bodies and our beings just as we are and with all the capacity and all of the opportunity to thrive and succeed and flourish and become that highest, most magnificent version of ourselves mm -hmm. without obstruction. Yeah. That's what I want for everybody in the world. And the only way to get that is for all of us to divest from a system that says that only some of us should be allowed to have that. Yeah. So I'm picking up on a thread. I don't know if this is right. I have a okay. feeling it's like, I think I got my lucky number. Um, so I, so side note, backstory, I have a, a, so I'm in DC and I have a local friend who, you know, in that sort of you know, we'll get together on a walk and talk and catch mm -hmm. up. And one of the things we do together is, is right. And I, um, I'm trying to think of where, because I had like a day and a half, I think my husband and kids were at like a cabin or something somewhere. So I was like alone, no distractions. Melissa comes over so we can walk and talk and write. And she shows up and I'm like, Sonia's on Brene Brown. Sonia's on Brene Brown. Let's listen. So we literally spent three hours listening, pausing, and then talking and listening and pausing <laughs> and reflecting. And we're like, mm, she worked that keto response real good there. <laughs> I would, like we were studying you. But this, I think what you're just talking about is when you talk with Brene about the ladder. The ladder, exactly. Because you have to step on someone's head to yes. push them down, to lift yourself up. And exactly. you talk about what if we create a system where there is no ladder. No ladder. Is that, exactly. is that what we're talking about? Too? Yes! That's exactly what we're talking about. You got it. <laughs> you got it. That's exactly what we're talking about. And so Melissa and I would rewind, play again, so much so that I, I ended up pulling that out and writing that down as the prompt that guided further. That was, that ended up being the rest of my writing thing that whole weekend wow. was just reflecting mm -hmm. and observing. Yeah, it's, it's stuck. And so- that's why I'm so grateful to see that sharp pivot because I do think that, I mean, it should have come so much sooner, but now more than ever, it is time that if we're going to be serious, right. And true to ourselves, right. We pick the work that we want to read and embrace and guide us, even when yeah. we're uncomfortable, even if we, oh, that's a hot potato. I might need to set that aside and try again tomorrow, yeah. right? But we need to at least be brave enough to choose what we're going to consume and, and absorb, right? Let it yeah. become goo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it will, it will transform. Even if you don't know, 
right? Absolutely. Because that work is really uncomfortable, right? Absolutely. And, you know, and especially for people who are like me, you know, genetically thin, white, cis het, all the, all those things that, yeah, here's your ladder, Rebecca, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it is, I'm also part of the group that has the power to help disassemble big pieces of the ladder. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, I think, you know, it, and I, that part is in the second edition. It was also in the first edition, which mm -hmm. is, it becomes so much easier to disidentify. The ladder is in us, but it is not us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is the piece that allows us to go toward the work with less fear and trepidation, right? Like, mm -hmm. yes, have I, have I been indoctrinated into all of the systems of power and dominance that exist in this world? Yes, I am an able-bodied, cisgendered, upwardly class mobile, college educated, you know, cisgendered mm -hmm. woman. Mm -hmm. I too have a list of privileges that mm -hmm. give me access to a world in a certain kind of way that does not give other people access. Mm -hmm. And I am not inherently a bad person because I have those privileges. It is not about being a bad person. It is about whether or not I am interested in only, but if those privileges are the only thing that make me good enough, then right, I have no interest in ever seeing those privileges be extended to anybody else. Because if they're the thing that makes me good enough and my understanding of good enough is also about somebody's gotta be, you know, if we're all on the ladder mm -hmm. and I'm good enough, but I'm good enough because I have these privileges, mm -hmm. then it means the people who don't are less than me and I need them to be less than me. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I, that's the only way I can understand mm -hmm. my own sense of value. And as long as that's the way we approach it, it's like, right, well, either I'm never going to think about it. I'm never going to think about my privilege because then that makes me complicit, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to think about it and actively protect it so that I have a one-up over other people. Mm -hmm. And what I'm offering is that we are all born into these systems. We don't have a choice about whether or not we're born into these systems. We do have a choice about whether or not we allow them to stand uninterrupted. Mm -hmm. and never looking at it, never acknowledging all the places where society is constructed to benefit me is one of the ways in which we keep that ladder firmly in place. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and so for me, there is not much of a difference between, you know, uh, unapologetic, you know, Nazi um, mm -hmm. and someone who's like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't see color. <laughs> like mm. they are the, they are the yeah. same they are the same identity they are the same outcome on a mm -hmm. spectrum mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. on, on a spectrum of passive harm to active harm but either way it goes it's harm right mm -hmm. the me being like oh no I don't you know I just don't think about what people with disabilities need mm -hmm. is a perfect way to make sure that there continues to be a world that never thinks about mm -hmm. what people with because mm -hmm. I am part of that world. Right. Unless at first it was, oh, sh <laughs> I didn't think about that. Oh, let me fix that. Right. That's okay. <laughs> exactly. And that's usually where most of us are, because again, we're not, we are not um, set up to think about our privilege. The whole mm -hmm. reason it's privilege is because it's invisible. It's you, you don't have to think about it. It's just your life. <laughs> it is just your life. Mm -hmm. And so when we are made aware, it is our opportunity to opt out of the ladder. Mm -hmm. That's what, and so when I get presented with those things, I don't think of them as, oh, now I need to be ashamed. Now I need to like think about what a terrible person I am. I say, thank you for another opportunity to opt out of this really crappy ladder. I do not desire to continue to participate in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's a gift. It really is a gift. Mm -hmm. And you know what I heard from you in that comparison between um, the Nazi and like, I don't see color in harm is, um, is acknowledgement, right? So if we're talking about baby step, right? Baby step to an awareness, awareness and acknowledgement would go hand in hand. And if that's what you're able to do, that is a step in dismantling a piece of the ladder, 
Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. And, and it is important for all of us. And again, and this is what I do in the fifth chapter of this book is I really give us concrete ways that we can start to disassemble the ladder inside mm-hmm. our own lives. Right. There are everyday ways that we, that we uphold the ladder that we don't even notice. Right. You know, we don't notice that we're upholding the ladder when we scroll through our Instagram feed and everybody looks and thinks just like us. Yep. Everybody has the same body we have. Everyone has the same racial identity we have. Everyone has the same class privilege we have. And so our life is surrounded in this, you know, homogenous, you know, circle Mm -hmm. of sameness. Yeah. And that is one of the ways in which we uphold the ladder. And so, you know, it can start with just like, oh, how do I not have my life look like me, like a carbon copy of me? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love how you frame things as experiments too, right? So it's like, we're walking through these different steps. There's reflections, there's things to do, but when you're in that part five, you have a specific, specific actions of doing throughout, you know, this is thinking, this is doing, but one that I just loved and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this sounds interesting, you know, and I, what's interesting, what am I curious about? And there's lots of ideas, you know, but just to go there and like what jumped out at me doing strategy two, queer your life, you know, and it's somebody who does not identify as queer, but have many friends who do. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, yeah, like why, why can't I be open and curious? And, and like you said, like experiment, because it is, it's an, it's like understanding more and learning more. And how will I learn more about the ways that the system put me into a binary? Right. And if I'm already teaching my kids that gender is not a binary and what those, you know, what that means and, you know, watching videos and this and that, it's like, there's also the experience of, you know, experimenting, exploring and learning, talking and just evolving. I think that's a big, you know, thing too. So yeah. Yeah. I really love it. And, um, you know, and I love that you put the thought before the action because it kind of sets, it kind of sets you up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you know, like if from the first edition, you know, I talk about moving toward a radical self-love practice as a thinking, doing, being process. Mm-hmm. First, mm-hmm. we have to actually get really intimate with our thoughts, mm-hmm. intimate with the with the way it is that just as a default, we move through the world mm-hmm. unconsciously. Mm-hmm. We have to bring that to consciousness because once it's brought to consciousness, mm-hmm. then we're at choice about how right. our behaviors will move or not move, right? Make a and choice. So <laughs> I, exactly. It's time to be at a choice. And so it's always about like, let me get intimate with my thinking first. Let me just mm-hmm. get honest about, and that's one of the things that I find people fear the most, right? Because that's that's where the goo is. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, I have to start thinking about my thoughts, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, was there a part of the book that you just feel particularly like personally proud of or connected to that's just a, I don't know, more of maybe a personal anecdote or backstory that you would want to share? Hmm. It, it, I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know if there's a part, you know, I feel, yes. So here's, I'll share, there's a portion in the very last segment where I talk about them. Um, getting willing to risk, mm. which is on page 125, okay. 124 and 125. And it, it is the evolution of a thought process that began, I would say back in 20, 2014, 2015, mm-hmm. uh, where I thought about like part of what keeps us from taking up the work of interrupting oppression and interrupting injustice is, that it feels scary and it is risky, Mm -hmm. right? And Mm -hmm. we are afraid that we will lose things. We are afraid Mm -hmm. that we will lose friends, we will lose opportunities, we will lose jobs. We are afraid we will lose those privileges that Mm -hmm. we get as a result of being part of whatever dominant culture we're part of. Um, And one of the, the things that I have been practicing for myself, but also asking other folks to think about is what does it mean to get willing to risk? Mm -hmm. to be willing to risk whatever, because at the end of the day, what we're really saying is, am I willing to risk 
some of my comfort for the possibility of all of our freedom. And in, mm-hmm. and when I put it in that equation, for me and my particular integrity, the answer is always yes. Mm-hmm. I would much rather be free than comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, but I also wanted to make it clear to people that it's not always the nuclear option, which is what we often think, right? It's like, right, no, I went in and I cussed my boss out and now I'm, <laughs> you know, now I'm now job. <laughs> now I'm like, it doesn't have to be that. And so I share in that section an experience of me with a group of people in New Zealand. So there is a whole lot of interesting barriers in this. I am in a different country. I am a different, you know, racial identity. Mm -hmm. I'm a stranger to a lot of the customs and ways and all the things that are happening. And and what I shared in in this moment was I shared the position of cisgendered privilege with the two other women I was talking to. And they um, began to make a comment that was transphobic. And it was this moment where I felt very personally um, called to my own, you know, like my own belief about this work. Like, what Mm -hmm. does it really mean to practice this in real time? And what I got clear was I needed to be willing to risk but it did not mean I had to destroy the whole relationship. <laughs> it mm. did not mean I needed to blow up our afternoon in you know, a fit of righteous rage. It meant that I needed to be willing to disrupt the um, collusion of privilege in that moment, mm. right? I needed, mm. I needed to be willing to say, I'm not in solidarity with our collective um, superiority over other over another group because mm-hmm. that's really what that is in that right it's like we as cisgender women are going to assume our superiority over trans identified folks mm-hmm. and what I was able to do in that moment was I was simply able to say without great disruption I actually love and have you know deep and powerful relationships with many trans people and they are powerful and beautiful humans and that's who I know them to be. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, all I did was risk disrupting our shared privilege. Mm -hmm. I didn't risk disrupting all the friendship. It didn't have to do all of that. I disrupted our shared privilege by saying, I am not going to collude in this act of superiority with you. Mm -hmm. And it's what's amazing about it is because we actually all know that it doesn't feel good. Like it's, it's, we actually know it's our lower selves. Mm-hmm. And so when we get caught in it, everybody's like, oh yeah, no, that's I actually didn't mean it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody backpedals, right? Because we recognize, oh, that's actually my lower self, mm-hmm. right? That's not my highest self. Mm-hmm. That's not me in, in the fullness of my humanity. And so in that moment, it was a check-in to actually invite us all back to a greater version of our humanity. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't risk, I risked my comfort. And what I gained was a greater sense of humanity and connection and an opportunity to interrupt a a small act of transphobia in the world. Mm -hmm. And when we do that on a collective basis, we restore all of our collective humanity. That's, right. that's what the process is. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that moment for me was a powerful one in the book. Yeah. Yeah. There's two things that I want to say in response to that. One is I felt this sense of, um, how your, your chosen response also matched your, your emotions at the time, right? Like you would have, might have chosen a different type of response if you were triggered in a certain way, right? Yeah. So you had enough of a grounded sense of like, let's stop and think. And what is aligned with my higher self and my values? And let me yeah. take, let me take a risky step anyway, and do this. And I think that's a point about that it is a choice option and that you can make a meaningful impact, even in a choice that might not, it feels scary and it might not seem like it's enough, right? Yeah. Um, the other part of it, and I was just, as I was listening to you tell the story, I was sort of making up my own stories in my mind of like what you might be thinking or what like a typical client might think. And it's almost like this inner voice, this inner monitor. That's like, 
be the good Sonia. Don't say something. Yeah. Right. And so it's interesting with the idea of goodness and the, you know, the caregiver, you know, mostly mm -hmm. female identity, right. Yeah. Of like, there's a list of rules of what it means to be good. And it's really about being quiet. It's really about yeah. don't disrupt the afternoon tea, exactly. you know, flipping the table and telling everyone to go, <laughs> you know, and so I just wanted to point that out because we have such a strong pull, right? Yeah. Culturally, the press of system of being good, right? Yeah. Being good never, and being, yeah. Being be good nice, and being be good, uh, which means always be quiet, never speak up. And that is that path that creates the fear. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And I think it's so important for us to realize that. So we're, and this is why I say like, who benefits from that voice? right mm -hmm. the the voice that tells you to be good and be nice and be quiet is a voice that desires you to stay in to stay in its box to stay mm -hmm. within its control to stay the subject of its power right mm -hmm. and so i'm always like play name that system it's one of my favorite games when i have a break something happening in my brain i'm like name that system what system is at play right now in the good nice be quiet system is patriarchy Mm -hmm. It is patriarchy. It is the system of male domination saying we would like you, lady, to mm -hmm. be quiet and be uh, submissive and controllable. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when I can name the system, that for me is always a great opportunity to be like, right, no, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it kicks up my self-righteous, you know, defiance. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it doesn't kick up your self-righteous defiance, like maybe you're you know, don't flip the table. I didn't have to flip the table. <laughs> right, right. This is important. I didn't have to flip the table. I just had to not allow myself to be complicit in someone else's harm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That yeah. And that's, that's actually why I kind of painted this picture of, because I think that again, fear will push you into this irrational place. It's not exactly. like, it's not like you stood up and just threw food everywhere. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? <laughs> And, and so often it's like, we'll get hooked on that fear. And I think it, it leads to fast silence, you know? Yeah. And so in your example, it's a calmer, a gentler, let me approach this. And yeah. that is rooted in all your radical self-love and all the words in this amazing <laughs> book and who you are as a person bringing gifts to us year after year after year. It's mm -hmm. so amazing and so, so beautiful to watch. And Thank I know you. people are going to buy it. I can't wait to help make sure that I help contribute to those numbers. Um, and you. as soon as I get a copy of the workbook, I really hope you'll come back and we can I would do love some to. chats. And I, share. I wrote this, Sonia. What do you what do you think? <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. I'm really excited for the for the workbook to get in people's hands. Mm -hmm. You know, there they are activities and um guidance that I've been thinking about for years, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've been thinking about before the books came out, a lot of these mm -hmm. activities sort of started way, way, way back. And so I'm excited to see them get in the hands of folks and for people to practice with them and to get to see what it really does for folks. So mm -hmm. yeah, I look forward to that conversation. Good. I have an idea. I have a friend who comes on my podcast at least once a month or so, but he is um, a Latinx male who's higher weight, primary caregiver of his kids um, and he was a chronic dieter, weight cycler. He mm. was actually on a very famous show that we will not name, but right. you know the name. name. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and he is coming so around identifying as fat and in his own being. And I think that the three of us having a chit chat about oh, some of your reflections oh, in that workbook. Oh, I think it'll be it. beautiful. So, I love yeah. It. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for everything. The body is not thank an apology, you. the power of radical self-love out now on a happy book rebirth day. Okay. And we want the butterfly cover, the new one <laughs> and the, the added insight and resources, you know, are well worth it. And so thank you so much for your time and all your wisdom. Um, I will be sharing this conversation everywhere I possibly can. Mm -hmm. And I just wish you so well until I get to see you again. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I appreciate all your support.
Um, and I want to make sure that folks know that if they got something valuable out of the conversation, in addition to um, supporting you through book purchases, which we love, that you also have a Venmo and Patreon. And it's Ooh. Sonia Renee Taylor. And yeah. that will be in the show notes. And um, and I just, I, I hope to see some, some, some gooey, gooey funds coming your way yes. for all that you've given us today. I look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And that's our show. The podcast is made possible with support from listeners. Please donate to help offset production costs at gofundme.com slash body kindness. And please rate and review the show when you have a moment. It really matters. Let's keep the conversations going on Facebook. Search body kindness and request to join the group for body kindness readers and listeners. Have a question for us to answer on a future episode? Visit bodykindnessbook.com slash question. Body Kindness books and audiobooks are available wherever books are sold. To request a signed print copy, visit bodykindnessbook.com slash order. For other questions about this podcast, please email info at bodykindnessbook.com.